hearing today is being recorded to comply with the public law for transparency. It will be available for viewing on Borough President Adams' website, brooklyn-usa.org, or on the One Brooklyn channel on YouTube. Again, web viewers may submit timely comments to ask Eric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov for Borough, President's considera Borough President Adams' consideration. Please call the first item and let us begin. Calendar item number one. 150282PQK. This application by the Administration for Children's Services, ACS, and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, for the acquisition of property located in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, Community District 8. Such action would facilitate a lease renewal and the continued use of the property as a child care center. Community Board 8 will be voting on this application on September 14, 2017. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any decisions until the, he hears from the board. Would Allison Grant, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Allison Grant. I'm the Chief of Staff for the ACS Division of Early Care and Education. And I'm here tonight in favor of the continued use of this space as a daycare center. Uh, this program is currently, uh, the program that is currently there is an early learn contracted program, which means that uh, they have a contract with ACS to provide childcare services to low income families. The contractor who's providing those services for, on behalf of ACS, is the Friends of Crown Heights which has been running this program for many years and has multiple programs throughout the community. The children that are served there um, must be certified as eligible by ACS as a child care program, and these families earn less than 200% of the federal poverty level and have to have a reason for care, meaning that they're either working in school or in a training program, homeless or looking for work for up to six months. I will quickly address some small things about the contract of capacity and then I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, right now, this program serves infants, toddlers, and preschoolers under the ACS Early Learn contract. Uh, there's space for 142 children to be served, and we're currently at almost 90% enrollment, um, with, of course, enrollment increasing this month as school just began, even though we are a 12-month program. So I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Is a representative from the center here? I don't Allison, do you believe know? so. Okay. Um, so I wanted to just start with, in the interest of the community for daycare facilities to serve neighborhood residents, what is the number of contracted seats and what are the criteria for selecting children to attend the center when vacancies arrive? Sure. So it's currently the contract is for 142 seats, eight infant, which is one classroom for infants, how many infants? I'm sorry. Eight. Mm -hmm. 30 toddlers, which mm -hmm. would be three toddler classrooms for mm -hmm. two-year-olds, and 104 preschool seats, uh, which are three and four-year-olds. And as the year goes on, some of them turn five. So mm -hmm. three to five is what we refer to them as. And um, the criteria I mentioned briefly earlier, um, it's w this is funded via Early Learn, and this specifically is funded via OCFS's Child Care Development Fund, which is the Child Care Development Block Grant. So these families have to earn up to 200% of the poverty level at the most and have a reason for care. And is there a cross-subsidized uncontracted seat? I do not know. We only manage the contracted seats. So the licensing is for 142 seats and all are filled? You mentioned it was 90% enrollment. Yeah, it's contracted for 142. I don't know what the DOHMH license is for. It might be more. Mm -hmm. And currently we're at um, almost 130. So uh, we have eight infants right now that that classroom's full, uh, 28 toddlers, and then around 90 pre preschoolers. I was just asking Richard if we invited the child care center uh, mm -hmm. to be present here today. Ina, I mean, I can answer most questions on their behalf or get back to Ina with any answers. Right. So. I, I would like to know, in, as far as this particular child care center is concerned, is there a number of seats that are uh, uncontracted and available for community where 
the criteria of up to 200% of the poverty level is not met because okay. they're exceeding income, but nonetheless are in need of childcare. And that's a growing demand amongst uh, what would be families that are falling short mm -hmm. um, right off the cuff. And so just to make sure that um, these seats don't go empty mm -hmm. because the demand is there. It's just that no one really knows how to access the seats. Okay. I'll reach out to Friends of Crown Heights um, early mm -hmm. next week, mm -hmm. and I will get back to you. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Borough President Adams has been concerned uh, concerning the city lease terms, um, making sure that our past mistakes are not repeated mm -hmm. Uh, regarding what would be short-term leases that end up uh, removing what would be uh, services, much needed services in communities. And so we're trying to understand and promote what would be long-term adequate with heavy oversight mm -hmm. leases. So, you know, this particular lease is, con is being renewed for how long? So... Um my, my full answer is, as you know, um, this mayor is very dedicated to retaining all our child care centers where they are. Specifically, this site, um, ACS, has been very strident in wanting to keep in this community. It's been in this community for a long time, and we are hopeful that it will be here for a longer time. In terms of the actual lease terms, my colleague Dale Lazarson is here from DCAS, who negotiates um, all leases on behalf of ACS. And since this one um, is something that she's managed, I'm going to defer to her to answer that question Absolutely. when she comes up. Absolutely. Do you want her to come up now? Absolutely. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. President. Nice to see you again. Thank you as well. Hi. Okay. And just identify yourself so that way we have yes, a clear you. record. Yes, for the record, my name is Dale Lazarson. I'm with DCAS, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services in the Real Estate Services Group, Leasing. Fantastic. Thank you. So to answer that question, the current uh, uh, situation with this lease, the tenure lease, uh, the last tenure lease, let me, let, me, let me back up. The city has been, ACS has been at this site since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The most recent lease um, was a tenure lease that started in 1995 and it did expire in 2015. Uh, we are working with the landlord. Currently um, on the table is a contract. Um, to get us into a short-term renewal for uh, the intention, which will go out to um, April of 2020, for the intention of taking some pressure, if you will, off of both parties that we do not have a contract in place. Um, in order to do a longer-term lease, which the owner is very agreeable to, mm -hmm. there are quite a number of action steps by both ACS and DCAS required. Uh, not just negotiation of terms, mm -hmm. but some other things, um, it, you know, a very, very significant due diligence on what kind of improvements might be needed in servicing mm -hmm. the building over term. Mm -hmm. So that takes time and resources, but when we are without a contract, the opportunity to stop and do all of that puts both parties at risk. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing is we have a, um, a proposal on the table now that uh, with your support we will uh, mm -hmm. move forward to execute on, which will run through April 2020, and th during that period of time, we will be working with the landlord, hopefully, for a successful long-term lease. Um, as I mentioned, the facility was uh, constructed for childcare um, at this time. And we have a good relationship with the owner, very professional. Um, uh, they're very interested in retaining mm -hmm. us. Yep, we just have to come to, come to some terms, et cetera. So um, I'm pretty comfortable that, um, uh, that we're not at risk here with this particular owner, mm -hmm. provided we act in a timely way. And ULERP, the mm -hmm. demonstration of ULERP and the city's commitment going through this process is certainly a demonstration to the owner of and our so, continued interest. And I appreciate the explanation, Dale. I, I'm just trying to understand, as far as the short-term lease, this is a opportunity for the landlord to do due diligence on upgrading what would be necessary uh, upgrades to the building in what would be a short-term lease with a option to renew for additional 10 years or uh, the, and not even or the right of first refusal uh, because I'm trying to understand the security of the facility itself and the 
preservation of the service in this community. So I'm, I, I'm not too sure if the short-term lease is to a, a two-part action item, right? So first part is let's get a short-term lease so that through 2020 we'll see these upgrades to the building year after year until we commence the year 2020 and then we have a renewal option or an option to buy clause. Let me provide clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to backtrack for a moment. Uh, no, the, the short-term lease is a band-aid cure between both parties to get a contract in place. Mm -hmm. When the contract's in place and the pressure is off a little bit, um, ACS will do its due diligence. It's not so much the landlord to do the due diligence, it's ACS to do the due diligence mm -hmm. about the building itself and what kind of improvements it may need. Now, the good news is um, this facility is in terrific shape. Mm -hmm. Thus far, we, we have great reports from ACS um, and, from, uh, and from other party inspections that's in pretty good shape. But that due diligence will be done by ACS. Uh, DCAS will, will um, receive the due diligence and then whatever work needs to be done will be negotiated. It is not an extension by a renewal option or a right of first refusal in any regard of the short term. In fact, if this was to play out the way that we hope it does, mm -hmm. what it would be is that when we go through our very lengthy city processes mm -hmm. to secure a new lease um, with all the right terms and conditions, whatever the length may be, it would commence, uh, it would commence um, upon execution, and if that's prior to April 20, April 2020, mm -hmm. it would be in replacement of that contract, and then the new one would take place. It's not an extension of it, however. So this is somewhat of a bandic here. Again, we, we found ourselves in a situation, unfortunately, uh, where the lease had expired, and as a result, well, we're on a month-to-month -month basis, which both parties are very, um, they're at risk, but we're working together to reach uh, terms, some dialogue about what kind of terms we want in a long term. Whether or not we will have a right of first um, offer or refusal to mm -hmm. purchase, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's a tough dialogue. This owner is a hold landlord, they're not a sell landlord. But the good news is, thus far in working with this owner, and the city does have other properties with this owner, um, I have no reason to believe that this owner is interested in um, other tenancies for the property at all. They are a long-term holder, so if everything goes well, negotiating a long-term lease should not be a concern for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And potentially with, with renewal options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I don't think that right now the opportunity to purchase is on the table with them because they're not a seller, but that kind of stuff, terms and conditions, will come into play once we get this particular contract in place. I mm -hmm. think, as I mentioned, the demonstration of Euler for this owner is a demonstration that we're committed. Right. Yeah. I, I will also offer one other thing, if I may. Whether we enter into this short term, whether we successfully in the middle of this actually reach terms and we never sign the short term and we go right to something longer term, mm -hmm. any contract we have, the, the duration, while it is so important for the community and for the program, with respect to the land use, um, we are in front of you requesting mm -hmm. approval for continued use. In fact, if we had no duration stated, it would give us the flexibility uh, to, to really be as, um, as aggressive as we can with the landlord in securing long term, not only the initial term of a, of a new lease perhaps, but also renewal options, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're really looking for um, uh, continued use approval from you. Right, yep. and so the continued use approval this year will mean that when 2020, April 2020 arrives, will you have to come back to a Euler hearing for another lease renewal or the continued use renewal today gives you the authority without having to come back? Right, that's a great question. And the answer is this. I got it, thank you. Yeah. And the, thank you so much. <laughs> Ken is always an educator of mine. The answer is this. Um, the City Planning Commission, mm -hmm. And now I'm taking you and I back a few weeks. The City Planning Commission has jurisdiction mm -hmm. on its resolution. Mm -hmm. When it issues a, um, a City Planning Commission report and resolution, mm -hmm. under the resolution, if the ULIP is approved for continued use, period, mm -hmm. not conditioned, mm -hmm. we will not come back to you. 
That is the greatest opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. It provides the greatest flexibility to continue to use without having to come back for this process and delay potentially executing mm -hmm. leases. Um, similarly, uh, if the report comes back that it is um, permitted for continued use, whether under a lease or a, an acquisition in fee of, mm -hmm without any limited duration, that also provides us terrific flexibility should the opportunity to purchase arise, we would not have to come back through the ULIP process. Is, is, that, is that, am I articulating that well? Very well. Thank you. And so I just wanted to get clarification so that the opportunities for the city of New York to have a secure hand in what it's trying to achieve, mm -hmm. long term and short term, um, so that we have a clear understanding on our end, what is most beneficial to the taxpayer as well as the community. Sure. And Borough President, I, and I'm not too sure, Dale, if this is going to concern you, okay. or perhaps it may in the sense of how you're continuing to have conversations with ACS um, and uh, the landlord, um, but Borough President Adams' vision to include beautification of our streets in Brooklyn while addressing storm water management practices. And we've been conducting borough consultation meetings with district managers and agencies, and this is one of uh, the areas that we're focused on. And the Ironically enough, today we just had Borough Service Cabinet meeting uh, where the Department of the Aging with the New York Academy of Medicine um, in collaboration are working towards an age-friendly New York City mm -hmm. um, under the Mayor de Blasio's leadership to be able to secure what would be uh, a small gesture of a bench in certain distances to view what is the landscape of the experience as you age in place um, to be enriched as opposed to a burden. Um, we also take into consideration what are uh, facilities where the city of New York leases or owns to be able to do the same um, so that if a grandparent is dropping off their uh, grandchild to be able to have what are uh, benches in front of these facilities, um, bioswells, uh, for integrated systems, for uh, stormwater management practices. And so I just want to understand if that is part of what are terms and conditions that your lease currently in this particular uh, case will be trying to stipulate, right? And, and perhaps not so forcefully stipulate, but rather coordinate um, be because we, we have been asking in the past for every lease you provide um, information for, um, and we have to circle back with you to be able to understand how many of those requests and recommendations are actually being uh, implemented. And so if, if you could just speak to that, that would be helpful. Sure, yeah. So uh, we may jointly answer this, um, if you'd like to. But initially, for the short-term lease, mm -hmm. um, to get into it, the, we call that a scope of work. Mm -hmm. right? What are the requirements? And yeah, you be a little closer to the mic, maybe. <laughs> for, the initial, yeah, for the initial um, short-term lease, mm -hmm. uh, or for a long-term, that's, that's a scope of, of work, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, those improvements would be either embedded in the lease or embedded in a process with ACS under a capital plan, um, uh, if it's, if it's uh, desired. For the short-term situation to get into this lease, uh, the improvement scope is not long at all, um, and that has to do with a number of capital issues and capital eligibility, et cetera. Mm -hmm. However, harking back to what I said earlier, during this short-term opportunity mm -hmm. is the due diligence opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, ACS will undertake uh, due diligence mm -hmm. to look at everything that they think that may be required and coordinate things. And DCAS uh, will have a little bit of a role in that if we need to help facilitate dialogue with other agencies. Mm -hmm. But ACS will develop what it believes to be prudent mm -hmm. for the site. Um, and some of that is exterior. Mm -hmm. Some of it is interior, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, and that this, uh, this length of time will allow them to do this thoughtfully. Yep, mm -hmm. then they'll come back for us. And, and then according, like, like any real estate contract, what's relevant to be included with a lease contract 
to the extent we're able to do so, we will. Mm -hmm. And what's relevant that they would like to implement that may not be relevant to go into the lease, that mm -hmm. maybe that's not the mechanism mm -hmm. for, for an improvement. Maybe it's um, something, if, for example, if Parks and Recreation is involved or mm -hmm. if Department of Transportation is involved, let's say you had a speed bump. That wouldn't go into the lease, mm -hmm. but that would be an ACS matter to coordinate with another agency. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the point being, um, to your question, this particular situation is nice. We will have ample time for ACS to be allowed to do its due diligence uh, to formulate what they require. Yep. Also physically, um, physically this particular property is set back from the street. Um, there's a, um, an open yard in the, in the front of it. Right. So that in itself provides an inherent um, uh, nice um, uh, opportunity if ACS would like to, you know, um, install any exterior furniture, et cetera, you right. know, kind of thing. So, right. Yeah. And there's, just to be clear, there's a, a state, uh, New York City DOT budget for uh, bench requests mm -hmm. that the agency, as far as ACS is concerned, could take advantage of. And so that's mm -hmm. why I raise it. Yeah. Um, because those dollars will quickly diminish and then you lose the opportunity for your facilities to have uh, these appropriate amenities. Um, as small as they are, they go a long way. Sure. And Allison, I see a bump on you. I <laughs> didn't realize. Yes, I'm due in December. Very nice. Congratulations. Thank you. So this is very near and dear to you, yes. <laughs> literally speaking. Um, Borough President Adams' policy to maximize job opportunities for Brooklynites with local businesses. We're trying to make sure that uh, every opportunity for hiring and apprentice opportunities arise within the daycare system, um, that those opportunities are shared, and we want to understand how uh, this particular step is promoted for local uh, hiring within the community. Mm -hmm. So um, ACS um, provides guidance, but for the most part, our programs, such as Friends of Crown Heights, do their own hiring. Um, they are our largest early learning contractor. They have 19 sites mm -hmm. and a home-based network as well, and they're quite good at keeping their vacancies mm -hmm. filled. Um, but however, I would speak on their behalf to say that uh, the Daycare Council of New York is a mm -hmm. wonderful advocacy organization that Friends of Crown Heights and many of our programs belong to, and they have uh, funds um, set aside to work specifically to help match um, daycare teachers with daycare programs that have vacancies. So they list vacancies and of course if anyone's watching at home please do check out the Daycare Council website. Um, they do list that and uh, could be very helpful in helping those that need a job and helping centers fill p positions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And given the um, outstanding violations on this yes. property what efforts will be made by ACS with the landlord to resolve these violations mm -hmm. prior to finalizing the lease renewal terms? And I know that we went into what is this being a short-term mm -hmm. action for long-term uh, security. Mm -hmm. And so, did we receive the list of violations? Did we receive the list of violations? Did we look at that? Okay, so we wanted to make sure that we had exactly uh, what are those violations. We looked up what would be the buildings mm -hmm. department website to see what was on file. I don't know if there's anything beyond what is public information that mm -hmm. needs to be part of uh, the transparency effort here through of this course. Euler peering. And so we just want to understand what are some of those violations. Sure. My understanding, so... Um as you know, I'm at ACS Early Care and Education, and I work closely with my colleagues at ACS Administration, which has the Lease Management Division. Uh, so my understanding from that team, who works diligently on all of our early learn programs, which we have 380 throughout the city, uh, they let me know that there were a couple Department of Building violations related to the elevator system, mm -hmm. and another that was related to the fire system. So elevator and fire. Um, our lease management program, uh, our unit, um, obviously they work uh, closely with Dale and her team in terms of the scope of work, but they manage the lease on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. no matter where we are currently are in negotiations. Mm -hmm. And they assured me today that yes, um, the landlord has been in touch with them about it and is currently working directly with Department of Buildings to address these violations, um, and that 
they will continue to update me and I can in turn update you. Um, mm -hmm. But I do feel confident that these are being addressed and mm -hmm. that the landlord um, fully has these in his, in his view and is working on them as we speak. Mm -hmm. So, And I know there's this um, good graces period right now where you want to be successful on both sides. Mm -hmm. The issue as far as the facility being on a month-to-month -month lease since it's expired in 2015, um, was the payment to the landlord ever stopped because of these violations? So, so the answer, as far as I know, since I've been here and involved in this, no, and there's a reason. Mm -hmm. Violations, uh, the particular structure of most of these leases have shared responsibilities with both mm -hmm. uh, the occupant agency mm -hmm. as well as the landlord. Violations can fall into two categories, therefore. Violations that are the owner's responsibility and violations that may be uh, the tenant's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Thus far, the owner, for any building violation, the minute that uh, the owner has become aware of it, uh, they're pretty good to begin to take action on it. So under most contracts, right, provided that there is a demonstration of a diligence to, uh, to prosecute, to cure, right, to correct mm -hmm. something, um, there, and, uh, and provided that, uh, that your operations are not adversely affected in any way, um, and I use the word adversely intentionally, mm -hmm. um, there really isn't a need to stop rent. That would be, um, that would be if, uh, if you lost square footage opportunity use, right, or, or you weren't really seeing any intention to cure. Now some of the these um, some of the buildings are a little older, and per usual real estate, things start to go wrong, and the Department of Buildings is on it. Mm -hmm. You know, so once in a while you get a violation, but once in a while, even when you cure it, it takes a little time for the Department of Buildings to update their records. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's that category as well. Uh, but at this point in time, there has been to what I would call exercise our cure right, which includes withholding rent until the landlord completes work because for anything that has happened thus far, um, the landlord seems very um, responsive. Yeah. Nothing for has both, risen to the level. Right. Yeah. For both um, elevator and fire code system. That's my understanding, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Any, and anything in that regard. Mm -hmm. So we're going to speak to see if anybody else wants to sign up. All right. So, I have no more questions, but I do want to just, uh, we have no one signed up for this particular segment of the hearing on this property. And so without any further interest, I will close this item and thank, thank both you. you, Dale and Allison, um, for the opportunity to just review this application. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Calendar item number 2170024ZMK. This application submitted by Brooklyn Standard Properties, LLC, seeks a zoning amendment to map a C1-4 commercial overlay within an existing R6A district on the western side of Bedford Avenue between North 10th and North 11th Streets in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Community District 1. The applicant intends to enlarge the ground floor of a four-story residential building and convert the community facility occupancy to that of commercial use. The rezoning would also bring four legal non-conforming commercial uses on the block into conformance. Community Board 1 will be voting on this application on September 18, 2017. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any decisions until he hears from the board. Would the representative for this application, Richard Lobel? You're not Richard. Please state your name for the record and present the application. Good evening, Madam Borough President. Uh, my name is Frank St. Jacques. I'm with How the law you, firm of, hello, with uh, Sheldon Nobel PC. Mm -hmm. you, how's that? So, uh, Frank St. Jacques here with Sheldon Nobel, uh, appeared uh, from Sheldon Nobel PC to represent the applicant on this uh, zoning map amendment application uh, before the, um, uh, before the, the Brooklyn Borough President. I will walk you through my, my presentation and uh, be available to uh, answer questions. So this is a zoning map amendment application uh, in the north side section of Williamsburg. The site is uh, currently zoned R6A. 
And the application proposes to, to map a C14 commercial overlay to a depth of 100 feet between North 10th and North 11th streets uh, on the west side of Bedford Avenue in Williamsburg. This is a, a map showing the, the proposed rezoning. As you can see on the left side, that's the existing zoning, R6A. And the proposal would stretch uh, an existing commercial overlay that's, that's mapped to the south uh, for six blocks uh, northward between North 10th and North 11th streets on the west side of Bedford Avenue. Showing a land use map here with the site outlined. It's 116 Bedford Avenue. It's an interior lot. And it's presently uh, being converted to a ground floor community facility use. So again, we're, uh, we're seeking to rezone the, the west side of Bedford Avenue. Um, this is, there's our eight tax lots fronting Bedford Avenue and one lot uh, fronting North 10th Street. Uh, as I mentioned, it was, it's currently zoned R6A and that zoning was established in the 2005 Greenpoint Williamsburg zoning. It's previously zoned M12 uh, in 1961 and that zoning stayed through 1976. Uh, in 1976, the Special Northside District, which uh, was an M, is a, a mixed use district pairing R6 and M12 uh, was established, and that uh, zoning was in place until 2005 when the Greenpoint Williamsburg rezoning uh, was established. So here's uh, a, another map showing the, the, the proposed rezoning area. The project site, 116 Bedford Avenue, is highlighted in green. It's at the center of the block, uh, and as I mentioned, there's uh, eight lots fronting Bedford Avenue five of which are uh, configured for commercial use on the ground floor. So that's uh, 1110 at the northern corner, uh, at the corner of North 11th and Bedford Avenue. And then moving southward, the site adjacent to 116 Bedford Avenue, uh, 118 Bedford Avenue, 1120, excuse me, 120, 122, and 124. And I'll walk you through which uses uh, th through each site. Um, two of the buildings uh, just to the north of the project site, uh, 1112, 1112, excuse me, 112 and 114 Bedford Avenue are both fully residential buildings, and the project site is, being, is presently being converted to a uh, community facility use on the ground floor. So a mixed building with community facility use on the ground floor. So I'm just going to walk you through the, the, uh, the uses on the block. This is the, the northernmost site within the project area. It's a four-story building, ground floor commercial use. The present use uh, is the Bedford restaurant, and there's uh, six apartments on the upper floors. Moving southward, 1112 Bedford Avenue uh, is a four-story, another four-story, the, all the buildings on the block are four stories. Uh, this has eight resi uh, residential units in the building, including ground floor commercial use. The adjacent building to the south, 114 Bedford Avenue, uh, is a uh, has eight apartments, again, residential on the ground floor. This is the project site, uh, 116 Bedford Avenue. It's currently under construction uh, to establish, to, there was previously residential uses on the ground floor, and they are, uh, the, uh, the, pro the applicant is uh, undertaking a horizontal enlargement uh, and converting the space to uh, community facility use, which is an as of right action. Um, if the rezoning were to go through, if the commercial overlay were to be added to the site, uh, the applicant would undertake a conversion to a ground floor commercial use. There are six apartments on the upper floors. Those are rental apartments, which are currently being renovated as well. The adjacent site to the south, directly adjacent to the project site, is a four-story uh, mixed residential and commercial building. The ground floor is con configured for commercial use. It's, uh, it was a Van Dolan's uh, yogurt shop, I believe. That site is not active at this point, and there's seven apartments on the upper floors. Adjacent to the south is another lot with ground floor commercial use. It was recently re uh, renovated. Right now it's a vacant storefront. It was previously a grocery store, uh, La Isla. The adjacent space to that is also a vacant storefront. 
It was recently re-renovated, uh, and there's a, the Department of Buildings issued a CO in April of 2017 permitting ground floor commercial use at that site. And the southernmost uh, lot fronting Bedford within the rezoning area, 124 Bedford Avenue, uh, also has ground floor commercial uses, uh, a restaurant, uh, all's well, fronting Bedford Avenue, and a salon uh, towards the rear fronting uh, North 10th Street. And finally, within the rezoning area, there's a small one-story garage fronting North 10th Street. So as you can see on this map, the, uh, in the proposed rezoning is in the, the, uh, the top portion of the map. Um, between North 10th and North 11th streets along Bedford Avenue. And there's a C14 commercial overlay that was mapped from North 4th Street northward to North 10th Street along the west side of, of Bedford Avenue. There is uh, three block fronts uh, from North 4th Street to North 7th Street uh, mapped on the east side of Bedford Avenue. The proposed rezoning uh, to, to map the C14 commercial overlay between North 10th and North 11th would bring the commercial uses that are present on uh, uh, currently within the, the project area uh, into conformance with zoning. Right now in the R6A, uh, commercial uses are not permitted. New commercial uses are not permitted or enlarged commercial uses are not permitted. So the, the C14 overlay would permit those commercial uses to, to continue. Uh, we believe that the uh, proposed rezoning is, is reflective of the existing built character of, of the area and the existing land use patterns and consistent with the rezoning or with the zoning to the south of the site. But note that the proposed C14 overlay does not alter the currently permitted R6A bulk, uh, so it doesn't change the maximum height or FAR with the rezoning. So we were recently, last week, at uh, CB1 uh, for our, the initial hearing. Um, and as you know, the, the community board uh, voted this project down unanimously. Since that time, the, uh, the applicant has, has gone out to seek support from some of the, the other owners on the block. Uh, and we'll note, and we can submit these, uh, we've, we've received letters of support from a number of the owners and uh, uh, building owners and business owners on the block. So the uh, owner of the business, the Bedford, on the northern portion of the project area has submitted a letter in support, as have the building owners for 120 Bedford Avenue, 122 Bedford Avenue, 124, uh, as well as the business owners on 124 Bedford Avenue, and uh, the building owner uh, of the adjacent building to the north, 114 Bedford Avenue. Also, across the street, uh, 121, and that should say 123 Bedford Avenue. Uh, the building owner also uh, provided a letter of support. We can submit these to the, the borough president uh, after this hearing. We're really, what we, we, we think what we're doing is, is consistent with the existing uh, zoning in the area. We understand that there's concerns relating to uh, potential quality of life issues with, with new commercial uses or with continued commercial uses on the site. But based on the, the, uh, the, the history of commercial use, on this block, um, we believe that this is consistent uh, and would uh, add to the character of Bedford Avenue uh, as a as a, uh, a lively commercial uh, thoroughfare. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Thank you, Frank. I just wanted to understand because you raised a red flag for me. The commercial space, and I'm very familiar, obviously, with what would be this block in the sense of having grown up in Williamsburg and yes. knowing that nest, turkey nest was the only thing in town um, for quite some time. Um, and now there's all this establishment on the block. And so your particular property, as far as your client is concerned, taking space and, and to convert it to community facility, how did you, or how did your client vacate that space for construction? Was it an occupied two residential units under DHCR rent regulations? No, so the, the, um, the applicant purchased the site in 2015 uh, and purchased the, the, the building uh, uh, 
not subject to any leases. It's not rent regulated. Uh, and the I believe the building it, is not rent regulated. It is not. No. And the two units that were con are in the midst of construction, mm -hmm. uh, no eviction notice procedures no, were filed the, in housing court. The, the building was delivered almost vacant, with the exception of two tenants that didn't have uh, active leases. And those are two tenants in one unit, or two tenants in two separate units. I, I, the, I'm sorry, I, I don't recall the exact specifics. The one of the building owner is here, mm -hmm. and I can just have him jump mm -hmm. in with, with that information. And please identify yourself. Thank you. I apologize. So, so this is David Mannheimer. He's he's a applicant. He's a representative of uh, one one six Bedford Avenue LLC, the applicant and owner of of one 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 six Bedford Avenue. Uh, he's he's informed me that uh, I misstated it was one tenant mm -hmm. that was in the building when they purchased the property. I'm uh, sorry. On, on the upper on one of the upper uh, floor apartments, not on the ground floor. The ground floor was vacant uh, upon their purchase. Okay. And the building is not registered with DHCR. It is not. So the the applicant you obtained that. a yes. They they've obtained a certificate of no harassment, uh, which I can provide to the borough president. And the certificate of no harassment was filed prior to the purchase. I, I believe it was after the purchase, correct? Yeah. After the purchase. Mm. Meaning, you didn't do the harassment because you received the building almost empty. I, I sure. Sorry, mm -hmm. I, David Mann, I'm mm -hmm. I don't... You're I don't, not aware. I'm, I'm not aware. Mm -hmm. The building was, uh, was delivered uh, vacant except for one unit. Mm -hmm. uh, the previous owner was well aware of the laws and um, spent fair amount of money, I believe, destabilizing the units a long time ago. And the, uh, the, um, uh, the letter of no harassment, yet they, they, we were able to give you know, prior tenants, so they were able to get in touch with as many people as possible to confirm um, that people left on their own accord. And the certificate of no harassment was issued by what agency? That's issued by HPD. And I would just note that that application process is very thorough. If, if you're not familiar with it, it requires... We set those standards in the 2005 rezoning. Uh, excellent. So, so that, that... And the certificate was issued to the new property owner, not the old. Correct. Based on the information relating to, I believe, the prior three years of, of use. The, the old property owner never tried, uh, attempted to get one because... Um, he was uh, spending a, quite a considerable amount of money. Well, no, a certificate of no harassment is needed if you want to do an alt one or an alt two work. So mm -hmm. I don't think he ever needed it. So mm -hmm. we, we needed it to do the mm -hmm. work. He never did any alterations. Uh, he Can you speak into the mic? It, Sorry, I only did the alterations prior Can you identify to yourself? Sorry, Benjamin <laughs> Cohn. I own the building with Mr. Manheimer. Mm -hmm. uh, all the alterations were done prior to 2005, and like according to DHCR history, the building was has not had any rent stabilized apartments for like more than 15 years, maybe mm. 20. I, I don't know exactly. Mm. And so you said the there were alterations already beginning in the building. No, like the the building had been completely renovated and w was actually. In just all done prior to ever needing a letter of no harassment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meaning prior to 2005. Correct. And so I'll go back to my original questions that were not asked. Should the commercial use be a restaurant or drinking establishment, what consideration would be given to a comprehensive operating plan inclusive of hours of operation and security measures? I understand that what you're filing is for community facility use. 
when you purchased the property, the community facility was as of right, but the construction had not been part of the previous owner. This is all under your new ownership, correct? And so correct. community facility, is there a prospective community facility tenant? It, at this point, no. Construction okay. is still underway. And so the community facility use that you have in mind is what? I it, noticed that there was classrooms in the rear so on the plans that we were given. At, at, I, can, I can explain mm -hmm. that. There, there's not an intended community facility user. The intent would be to deliver that space raw to mm -hmm. uh, a community facility tenant. And in the event that the rezoning were to, to go through and the C14 overlay were added uh, to deliver to a, a commercial tenant after a conversion uh, to a commercial use. Mm -hmm. um, I, the the plan that was that that you saw that has classrooms in it right. was part of the environmental assessment statement. I believe the drawing that had significance in on that drawing sheet uh, was the roof plan showing chimneys. I, there's there's a portion of the EAS that related to code compliance uh, for that that chimney. The, there's not an intent for a specific community facility user. Uh, ultimately, the space would be delivered raw to a community facility tenant and purpose built to their needs, whether it be a medical office, a, um, a, a drug treatment clinic, a uh, nonprofit office, uh, a, a daycare. Um, that tenant would determine what the internal configuration would be. So there's, there's no. But you're filing for a rezoning, which doesn't it's not required for the uses you just described. So based on if the zoning is approved, what type of uses are we talking about? Are we still talking about community facility uses? Are we talking about retail commercial uses? No, and I'm sorry, let me take a step back, because the, the intent is to, with the commercial overlay, the purpose of this application is to establish a commercial use at, one, at 116 Bedford Avenue. So the, um, in, in the event that commercial use were approved at this site, a commercial tenant would be sought. The applicant- Not community facility. Not community facility if commercial use is permitted at this site. So is the intent community facility or is the intent commercial? The intent is commercial uh, with, the, with the understanding that commercial can't be tenanted at this site without the C14 overlay that's being proposed here. And type of commercial tenant, any thought given towards what type of tenant you hope to secure? So there's a lot of thought has been given. Um, we're still a ways out from, from being able to establish a, a commercial tenant. Um, they haven't identified a specific uh, commercial use or user or tenant. Um, the, the applicants own the building and they own the, the, the residential units above. They're looking to make sure that whatever commercial tenant they, uh, they, they have in, in the building um, is, provides a good balance for the residential users above. Um, we understand that there's concern about uh, eating and drinking establishments on the block. Um, I, I think that there's, I, the applicant also has, uh, has the same concerns about quality of life issues. They want to be a good neighbor and they want to make sure that their commercial tenant isn't disrupting their residential tenants or the neighbors. It's, 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 a, it's a bad business proposition for them. That said, they haven't narrowed down uh, a potential tenant because the site's not on the market yet. Uh, so let me just mm -hmm. jump in that should a restaurant or drinking establishment be pursued we just ask that consideration be given to working with the local residents and the community board in terms of as Deputy mentioned in terms of a security plan hours of operation so this way this harmony should that type of use be there uh, understood. And, and to answer the question that was posed, I, the, the applicants would consider um, reviewing such a plan and uh, and working with the community and the neighbors to uh, to articulate specific uh, um, operational controls. Should this rezoning application being considered be approved, what would be the added potential for sidewalk cafes and backyard? table service on these lots, not just your own, um, because it is expanded. And was the expansion a recommendation from the Department of City Planning, or you came in with these blocks drawn out? 
So when we go into the Department of City Planning with a new rezoning application, we're looking at our client's site. So knowing that on an interior lot in the middle of a, of a block, the, the Department of City Planning isn't going to just map a, a commercial overlay over our site. We initially looked at a, let's see, a rezoning boundary that extended 125 feet from North 10th Street to cover essentially see the, the red outline is, is the project site. Mm. The, the four commercially configured uses uh, to the south and our site and uh, didn't include the three, the three buildings to the north. Um, city planning uh, articulated concern about uh, a, a smaller rezoning area uh, that was just 125 feet from North 10th Street they also noted that the, the corner site uh, uh, at the corner of, of Bedford and North 10th was an active commercial use and that uh, a commercial overlay would have a better land use rationale if it captured all of the existing legal nonconforming uses on the block. Uh, we agreed to extend the rezoning to, uh, to take in that, um, that site. Our primary concern as, as an applicant and uh, a building owner trying to establish a commercial use at 116 Bedford is, is an overlay that, that covers our site. Um, we believe that there is a rationale for taking the entire block front. The six block fronts to the, to the south are, are similarly mapped. Um, but understand that you know, there are two, the, the, the two residential uses on the block are located uh, on, the, on the two lots just north of, of the applicant's site. Mm -hmm. You haven't answered the question, though. So going back to the question, talking about lots that would have backyard potential oh, and right. also cafe potential. So just if you got the best slide to show you this. So this is uh, the city's Zola map. It shows the footprints of the buildings. You can see the, the northernmost site is built full. Uh, where the Bedford restaurant is currently. A backyard wouldn't be, a backyard uh, dining use wouldn't be uh, established there because the, the, the building is built full. However, all of the sites along Bedford Avenue um, could be uh, subject to, to seeking the uh, sidewalk cafe license from the Department of Consumer Affairs. As you know, that's a, that's a process. The, uh, the applicant for a sidewalk cafe license would have to apply to DCA, go before the community board, I believe go back before DCA, and then go to the city council for an approval of, of that license. Um, there are, sidewalk cafes are, are essentially permitted uh, in along nearly the entirety of, of Bedford Avenue where there's a commercial overlay. There's not many incidents, uh, or uh, not many sites that have taken advantage of the uh, sidewalk cafe permit. Well, Frank, along. Just, yep. just to be clear, right now, mm -hmm. as it stands, the current situation doesn't allow them to. It's this action that would, in the future, allow them to. So, to be clear, right, if, if this, the C14 overlay were added to this block front, applicants could seek a sidewalk cafe license, subject to approval by in the future. Affairs. In the future. If, but if there were a commercial overlay, uh, they could seek a sidewalk cafe. And right permit. now, without this action, none of those establishments would have that right even to begin with. Correct. A, a sidewalk cafe, it, you need a license to have a sidewalk cafe. You also need... And so the ones that you have signed, there should be one, two, three, four, five letters in here? and also the businesses. Okay. And then we didn't sign one, but... Well, you're the applicant. Right. <laughs> I get it. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. I appreciate this packet. Thank um, you. For the record. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to... Apologize for the interruption, Fodi. Uh, no problem. 
Uh, my name is uh, Fody Jovanis. I live at 112 Bedford Avenue, and uh, I'm here to speak in opposition to the uh, rezoning. Um, um, the, I, I've been living on that block since 2000. My father grew up on the corner of Metropolitan and Lorimer nearby. Uh, I've seen a lot of changes in the neighborhood, um, and it's a great place to live, but these, uh, the, the amount of gentrification that, takes, that has taken place has come with many problems. Um, it's really noisy. Uh, the restaurant that moved in, taking the place of a, of a record store at 110 Bedford Avenue, um, installed a ventilator uh, on, on their back lot, uh, which is just outside my window. Uh, just yesterday, there was an agent from the Department of Environmental Protection from New York City uh, who took a decimal reading of 60, uh, which it, uh, is in excess of what's permissible. Uh, the permitted level is 42. Um, it really concerns me to have uh, more of these kinds of establishments. I um, hear that, um, the, that the applicants are saying that they're going to consult with the community, and that sounds all very well and good, but once the rezoning happens, they actually won't have to consult at all. And uh, I just think that they're in it to try to collect as much rent as they possibly can. I don't blame them, but it adversely affects the rest of us. Um, the, regarding the question of consistency, sure, the s south of us, it's, there's a lot of, com there's a lot of uh, commercial uh, establishments. Uh, it's great, you know, I can stop and get my groceries as I walk home from the L train. Um, but uh, uh, directly across from us and north from us, there are very few businesses. So I would say keeping our side of the block uh, free of more commercial businesses would enhance the consistency uh, uh, and quality of the neighborhood uh, as opposed to dilute it. Uh, let's see, I need some more notes. Uh, yeah, I think those were all the points I really wanted to make. Um, again, just wanted to state my opposition to it. Thank you, Fodi, I appreciate it. No, John, John McDonald. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm John McDonald. I live at 112 Bedford Avenue. Um, I'm here to speak in opposition of this rezoning. Um, it's, uh, it, our neighborhood and our block um, specifically has, uh, has gone through a lot of, of change, um, but it is primarily residential, um, both sides. Um, up until now, we've had three functioning businesses on our side of the block. Out of eight buildings, there was three. There's the two eating and drinking establishments on the corner and a market in the middle. Um, there are two storefronts that are there that are vacant um, that have not had any businesses there in some time. In fact, 122 was a residential space until very recently. Mm. Um, earlier this year, it was converted to storefronts. Um, and as far as I understand from the Department of Buildings, a representative who was at our community board meeting last week had said that any space that um, was not a functioning business for uh, two consecutive years would automatically be converted to residential. Um, so although it's been, that was what the, the community board representative told us last week. Um, who from the community board? He was, not the community board, I'm sorry, the Department of Buildings representative who was at the community board meeting um, had stated that was the case. Um, I had heard that before from another Department of Buildings representative that under the R6A zoning, if there was a, a non-functioning business space, that it was converted to residential. That's what we were told on several occasions. Regardless, it, we've had three, only three on that side one um, eating and drinking establishment on the other side. So that's four commercial uses on the entire block. So it's been primarily um, residential. And so like Vody was saying also, we think that the, keeping the consistency moving northward towards McCarran Park um, is a valuable thing in our community where 
we've been so inundated by commercial spaces and bars and restaurants to maintain some sort of, of or some sections of primarily residential spaces is important. And for those of us who live there, it's a real quality of life issue. We've had to deal with noise and traffic and you know, just the busyness of the street growing consistently. Um, and so with this overlay, it could increase that much more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, um, the support that they were providing, um, I'd be curious to know how many of letters of support are also residents of the block. They might be owners of businesses, they might be owners of the building. Um, I know the owner of 114 Bedford does not live in the building. He's not a resident. Right. So, um, and so, so yeah, so that's pretty much what I wanted to say. So, yeah. And I appreciate what you ended with as far as the tenants are concerned. And, yeah. um, you know, it, nothing requires what would be uh, the tenants being notified. I think there is a neighbor to neighbor effort mm -hmm. to notify. Um, That's how I found out. I found out sure. from my neighbor who sure. found out through Facebook. Right. And it's so. the same building, right? So yeah. only one building on the block yes. is aware as far as tenants are concerned. Um, I think there's an opportunity for you all to share the information beyond your building. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, I don't want to blame one property for the future doomsday of what is the block. Mm -hmm. um, I think overall, the community board has had its fair share in the last 10 years of um, this craze from quiet, you know, very culturally diverse community with very few establishments to now it's just every other lot is a nightlife establishment and it's causing a lot of heartache, anxiety, and uh, speculation to rise. Um, and so we're trying to understand how to deal mm -hmm. with what our residents sharing that experience and trying to uh, facilitate conversations with what would be property owners and establishments um, whose businesses, perhaps they don't own property, but are commercial tenants of. Um, so, you know, this is a, a three-part series of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, and the borough president, I know, has uh, engaged with the Nightlife Association built in uh, what would be Community Board One. Mm -hmm. um, and the citywide effort of nightlife issues um, because it is a growing concern in the city of New York. Yes. Um, so it's not to give you lip service, it's just to recognize and acknowledge what you're saying. Yes. Um, and, you know, we, we want to make sure that we deal with what is mitigating as much as we can through oversight. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the opportunities, it's not like the, this commercial establishment is going to open. Um, it's not one particular site, but the accumulation, the aggregate number of. Right. And, and I think if they had moved, or if they moved forward with the community uh, facility space, like that would provide us with, with more of a balance that, that we don't currently have. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Duly noted. And, yeah. and if, um, if you could just provide us with the name of the building rep that the building's department representative who expressed to you what is that particular two-year mark revert back to what was its original status of residential okay. to confirm that particular building code okay. and regulation so that you're not led down a road of misunderstanding or mm -hmm. false information. Yes. So. Actually, there's a section of the New York City zoning resolution. It's in Article 5, Chapter 4. It deals with non-complying use. And the 24-month rule that you mentioned, there is an exception to that rule, and it's in three different zoning districts, R5, R6, and R7-1. 
and the R6A is part of the R6. And it's, it has language basically that it relates to the, the look of the ground floor in terms of being storefront-like and that the 24 month does not serve as a limit for those three districts unless such district is in a historic district, which this location is not. So okay. one would be able to take a vacant space. It is limited to use group six and there are certain uses within use group six that are precluded from being allowed to open in that circumstance. So, so those spaces can be reactivated uh, with a few limitations. And notice that the C1 overlay that the applicant is seeking only allows uh, use group six. So it's, it's reasonably consistent with that provision. The big difference is there's a couple of additional uses the overlay allows, and it does allow backyard usage for table service, and it also obviously using zoning rights to build into the rear yard, as well as applying for sidewalk cafes. And so to answer the question, 122 can be converted back to residential or not? So, or you're one, gonna look into so 122 can be because of the storefront, yes. So your building and 114, because of the nature of facade, I don't believe it would meet the definition of this Article 5, Chapter 4 so ruling. So the facade at 122 was like ours until very recently when it was just converted. Um, so I don't know if that impacts right, anything. Yeah, Which so we could get you, if you, you, if you like message Google. us, we get you the language and so. Again, how that was filed, whether yeah. it was cell certification or not, that's something that could be looked into, whether that was consistent with that section. But it would have had to be based on that section to do the conversion from a residential space. Okay. Excellent. Right. Thank you. Thank you, absolutely. Christine, I apologize, I'm going to exit. Richard will continue to chair. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Christine Breik and I'm opposed to the rezoning. Um, one thing I want to bring to your attention is one of the buildings that showed um, the f former uh, frozen yogurt place. I believe it's 120? 118? Um, that is not zoned. So we're actually, they're, they're, they're coming forward and saying we're five res of, um, Three residential and five commercial. Currently, we're actually four and four. And we have the paperwork to show that too. Um, we are extremely concerned with it, the whole block becoming a commercial area. Um, there are many yards there. The concern is too, for the two buildings that are residential, of what could stop an owner from saying, okay, let's take out the to residents on the bottom floor and make a storefront, just like they did at 122, where people consistently lived for, I've been there, I've been living there now since 1998, and there were tenants on the ground floor until recently. So I don't know how that was able to change, and I think, I believe somebody said April of 2017, it was rezoned. I don't know how that happened. How, how did it go from a residential for maybe longer than I'm there since 98, where two, two apartments were on that ground floor to now being two storefronts? So I, I don't know how that happened. But our, our concern, we have, we have trouble right now with um, 110 Bedford uh, which is a bar restaurant. When they went into, into that, it was a record store, then I believe it was a clothing store for a while. Uh, they went in there saying, said to the community, don't worry, everything's gonna be fine. We're gonna soundproof the wall in between 110 and 112. Never happened. They got in there, they did not care after that. There have been multiple complaints for the last few years filed. Then they recently ad added this vent to their roof, which is lower than, it's, it's a low building. Um, and the, we keep our windows closed and we hear three rooms into our house. So 
Our concern is that if we allow the whole block to become commercial, this is what we're going to deal with, and our quality of life will drop drastically. And I believe this is why our community board heard us and voted unanimously against the rezoning. Okay, thank you. And again, we'll look into 122 to see how they filed plans. There was not a rezoning, so the only way you could take a space and convert it would have been based on this Article 5, Chapter 4 section. And if, if it was deemed consistent by the Billings Department with that regulation, then that space would be fine. Would it, would it be consistent with, uh, how do you mean consistent? If, if it was residential for, say, 20 years, wouldn't that be considered residential? We'll have to look at how the text was explicitly written and how they presented that argument to the Department of Buildings. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have one last speaker on this item. Uh, Robert Goldstein? Goldstein? Goldstein. Uh, good evening. I am uh, not really the owner, but the property manager. Could state your name for the record also. Uh, my, my name is Robert Godlewski. I'm the property manager for 120 Bedford Avenue. Uh, my mom owns the building, but I do pretty much everything. Um, so I'm in, I am in favor of uh, the commercial overlay. Um, and I just wanted to make a few points. Um, I've lived on the block all my life for 26 years. I lived across the street, and then I moved um, to 120. And uh, when I was a little kid, what I remember was very little retail, very little commercial. Um, just it was basically no one wanted to be on that block. Um, and as soon as stores started opening up and restaurants and they became better and better, higher end over time, um, the block improved and it's actually very beautiful. Um, yeah, so I feel that commercial uses make the block better. Um, regarding 122, he is my next door neighbor. I've known him for a while. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I can speak on his behalf. I probably can't, but I know what the story is. Uh, the story is he had a commercial space on the first floor. Um, he made, he transformed that into two apartments, uh, not knowing that it was illegal to do that. Um, and after a few years, um, he actually I believe the Department of Buildings went after him to confirm, to conform with the Certificate of Occupancy, which stated it has to be a commercial use. Um, so he didn't, he, he removed the residential apartments and transformed, the commercial, transformed it into commercial in good faith um, to conform with the uh, Certificate of Occupancy. Um, yeah, and um, actually it's regarding the vacancies on the block, there are two vacancies. Uh, one of the vacancies is mines. Um, I had a very, um, well, I wouldn't say very, but a higher end organic food store in there for four years. Um, the organic food store moved out last month. Uh, we renovated the place, we made it very nice, and we are currently looking for a very, uh, very good tenant to take over. And I'm sure I'm not the only one um, on the block in the group of property owners who knows that um, to keep your residential tenants happy, you have to have a good commercial unit, commercial tenant on the ground floor. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, it's common sense if 116 um, thought the same. Um, you know, if with the rents on Bedford Avenue for apartments, you can't, you know, you can't just put a whatever commercial tenant on the first floor. You actually have to, you know, do your due diligence research and put someone good or else your tenants are going to move out and you're going to have a problem. Um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. I'm in favor of it. I think um, it's good for the block. Um, they reached out to me um, personally over the phone and in person for my opinion. Um, they were very nice and I said yes. Um, I also, you know, reached out to other landlords on the block for their opinion. Um, you know, we got the letters of support. Um, I heard the same story from other owners. They think it's a good idea. And oh, um, <laughs> regarding you wrap up. yeah, yeah, uh, regarding 112, I believe that building is um, co-ops or condominiums, if I'm not mistaken, and that's the only building on the block that is of that classification. Um, I'm not a, I'm not an official or a lawyer, 
but I think that they would have no advantage uh, for, their, for their building if the zoning happened because they're co-ops, condominiums, residential only. Um, so I can see why they're in opposition. But, you know, that's, it's, if, the, if, the zone, if the rezoning happens, they can remain as they are. Uh, we would basically, you know, it would just only affect us. It wouldn't affect them. So I can't imagine it being a big problem for them. I mean, that's in my opinion only. I can't right, put thank words you. in people's And mouth. just to let you know, with a commercial zoning, you also have the right for a CFO change to convert the space to residential if that would also be of interest. Right. It's an option. I mean, you know, so in, 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 in a few years, for, for a few years, residential was doing really good, retail was doing really bad, then it switches. I mean, as long as it's an option, if people can choose, it's a good thing. If you're, if you're forcing people to do something, it's a bad thing. With the rezoning overlay, it gives you an option. Either you can do residential, you can do community facility, you can do commercial, it's up to you. No one's forcing you to do anything. And I think that's a really good idea. That's the main, uh, the highlight of the overlay instead of a forced uh, commercial zoning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we have no other signed speakers, so just asking if there's anybody in the audience who would like to sign up to speak in this item. Okay. Um, all right, you have to, when you're done speaking, if you could fill out a speaker slip, please, even though you spoke as an applicant. Um, basically, all I want to say is, you know, Again, we, state your name for the record. Sorry, Benjamin Cohn, owner, uh, co-owner of the building. Um, you know, there's been a lot of speculation on, you know, they, they think that things are improperly commercial, but, you know, the standing thing is that they are commercial and if they are disputed, so be it, but I, I just don't want to get too caught up in the speculation of that because that seems to be a very strong argument from this one building, but as far as everything, as far as any city agency is concerned, none of these buildings are doing anything wrong. Um, you know, uh, you asked earlier uh, what we would put there and, you know, we, we want to do something to enhance the community and, and, you know, something that would enhance our building in the block and so you know our first thing is not actually a bar or restaurant we we did we don't have the right really to go get a commercial tenant but we have inquired and we've sort of you know found out uh, that you know I, I think we'd like to put in a store or something or some sort of like gym or you know like more like a yoga studio something that like would would hopefully make the community good, but again, we don't know anything for sure. Um, Just to let you know, a gym is not allowed within a C1 district. Okay, then not a gym. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, again, because we don't have the use, I haven't, we haven't done too many things. And then um, the other thing is basically uh, in terms of community facility, you know, we've done some investigating and, you know, the the most profitable things seem to be like uh, a drug treatment facility or some sort of homeless thing. So, you know, I don't know. I guess people were asking what we were pursuing, but I guess that would sort of be, we, we don't really know. Again, we would have to look at what's the, the best commercial tenant, I mean, community facility tenant to get, but that's sort of been our initial inquiry since uh, we've only been looking at it for a week since we had uh, the vote at the other hearing. So that's it, I just wanted to answer that. But again, we would love to do something responsible. Uh, if we get the commercial overlay, we would love to do a store that makes everybody happy. We would love community input. And you know, if soundproofing or anything else is required, or you asked about store hour security, we would abide by anything like that. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna go now to the uh, Third item, calendar item number three, 170356 ZMK and 170357 ZRK. These applications submitted by 1121 uh, Delaware LLC seeks a zoning map and zoning text amendment on a block bounded between Carlton and Vanderbilt Avenues and between Dean and Bergen Streets in the Prospect Heights section of Brooklyn, Community District 8. The zoning map 
amendment would be a boundary adjustment that would zone an R6B district into an area now zoned as an M11 district. The zoning text amendment would designate the rezoning as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. The proposed actions would facilitate the development of a four-story multifamily residential building with 26 dwelling units, 10 being affordable housing, and 13 enclosed spaces. Community Board 8 will be voting on this application on September 14, 2017. Borough President Adams will hold off making any decisions until he hears from the board. With the representative for this application, Joshua Ryan Smith, please state your name for the record and present the application. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Joshua Reinsmith from Ackerman LLP, uh, Land Use Council for the Applicant. I'm also joined here this evening by Lauren Malhotra uh, Godet, as well as Brian Ripple, uh, the project architect. Um, the, as was mentioned, this is a zoning map amendment and text amendment um, to essentially extend an existing R6B zoning district um, to include a property that located on the north side of Bergen Street between Carlton Avenue and Vanderbilt Avenue in, in Prospect Heights. Um, the property uh, in question um, is currently an existing uh, vacant uh, asphalt parking lot um, that has approximately 12,400 square feet in lot area. Um, it is, as uh, was mentioned, located within an M11 zoning district, which perm permits commercial, um, manufacturing, and limited community facility uses. Um, permitted FARs for commercial manufacturing use are 1.0, um, and for the community facility use, um, it's a 2.4. Uh, permitted height under the existing zoning is a 30-foot street wall. Um, and uh, after a 20-foot setback um, can raise to 50 feet. There's actually no um, height limitation in the M11 zoning district. Um, you're just required to, to comply with the sky exposure plane. Um, the property has been vacant um, since, I believe, at least the 1960s, um, and it's been used uh, for parking and open storage um, in connection with some of the other buildings um, in the area. Um, so, as I, uh, the, the actual uh, zoning application involves the extension of an adjacent R6B zoning district to facilitate the development of the four-story building, um, as well as a zoning text amendment to designate the area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. I'm just going to real quick go back to the area map. Um, in addition, so, um, does this come off? Um, the current R6B zoning district is mapped to a depth of 100 feet from Carlton Avenue um, and then comes down and uh, goes east uh, along the rear lot line of the existing residential um, that are on the north side of Bergen Street. Um, we are proposing to extend the district boundary um, and will actually include these three uh, townhomes which are currently non-conforming uses in the M1 zoning district. Um, and then we'll um, head east at the center line of the block to include the existing vacant um, development site. Um, I'm sorry, and, and here's the uh, zoning map which just basically corresponds to what I just said. It's just a little easier to have the other properties on it. Um, so the proposed development uh, will be four stories of residential. It will have a subsurface parking garage. Uh, the post floor area will be just uh, over 27,000 square feet, um, which is a 2.2 FAR, uh, the maximum permitted in an MIH area within an R6B. Um, we're proposing a base height of 30 feet, 38 feet that would align with the um, existing uh, three-story townhomes um, that are located to the west, uh, which are also located within the Prospect Heights Historic District um, before the building sets back uh, and rises to its maximum height of um, 50 feet. Uh, 26 dwelling units, 16 market rate, and 10 affordable units. Um, and the uh, 
the unit breakdown um, is 14 one-bedroom units and 12 two-bedroom units. Uh, the, the property owner and the developer um, is in the business model is to develop long-term assets. They want longer-term tenants, um, and so they are attempting to cater to to um, unit sizes that, that gear that way. Um, there will be 13 parking spaces in the sub-cellar, um, eight of which are required by zoning. Um, here's a, a site plan um, just showing uh, the proposed building. Um, and then we have some generic floor plans showing the various uh, um, layouts of the, the individual units. These are all subject to change once we, uh, or, or modification once we actually do our geotechnical and start laying out the building structurally. Um, but as of right now, this is uh, the, the model that we're proceeding with. Um, and uh, project developer is a, a Brooklyn-based developer. Um, it's developed commercial and multifamily residential properties. As I had mentioned, all the properties are developed and retained as long-term assets. Um, an overwhelming majority of uh, all of the developers' contractors, um, even some of their suppliers, are from the borough of Brooklyn. Um, I think historically, this percentage has exceeded 50%. Um, uh, the developer is a, a minority, um, and the general contractor is a minority as well, um, and uh, will be seeking actually city certification on, as a, a certified MWBE. Um, they have a, a number of residential projects uh, in and around um, this area in Brooklyn, um, including uh, one of more recent projects that was completed was the um, Gothic Revival Church in Fort Greene Historic District. It was uh, an old abandoned church that was in, uh, had extensive damage um, and, and required um, extensive amount of refurbishment. Um, and it was renovated and converted to, to 12, or I'm sorry, 11 rental units. Um, but the historical integrity of, of the project, uh, or the building was maintained. Um, and the developer uh, didn't spare any expense in, in doing that. Um, that's the, the essence of the rezoning application. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So Bergen Street residents, uh, you're aware that they've expressed concern that the proposed dormers, the zoning term dormers, mm -hmm. are not appropriate given that the building borders the Prospect Heights Historic District. What consideration has been given to building with a full street wall setback for the top floor? So we've, uh, we've actually begun to look into that preliminarily. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Brian Ripple, the project architect, to come up because we have uh, an updated rendering um, that shows uh, the building with that full 15-foot um, setback. Um, we understand and are sensitive to the concerns of the Bergen Street residents, um, considering that uh, adjacent to us and across the street are within the historic district, and, and we're sensitive to that. Um, we don't have a final plan to, to circulate, um, but I just want to show within the, the limited time since um, the community board meeting last week that, that we have taken a look and, and we're looking to address that issue. And perhaps if you hold it up, that it could be seen by the camera. And if you'd like to come closer to be able to see better, you're quite welcome as the seats are here. Um, I'm not sure if you can, can see. Uh, but essentially what we've done is eliminated the dormers in their entirety. We have the full 15-foot setback. Um, and we've recaptured uh, some of that floor area in the rear of the building. Um, basically, we, we had a... 36 foot rear yard at the time. So we've made the building a little bit deeper and trying to, to capture some of that usable square footage um, through the use of some foyers in the, the, built, the units that are in the rear of the building. Um, so we haven't finalized layouts, um, but we've been working on um, eliminating the dormers uh, to address that issue. So just a point that obviously the zoning in itself doesn't lead to that and perhaps giving thought to how the applicant might lock in such a commitment 
in a legally binding agreement. Okay. Um, we haven't gotten to, to that stage yet. Um, we want to, before we can actually commit to anything of that nature, we need to see how the apartments well, actually there, There's up. time between now and the council vote to Understood. give consideration to that. Uh, absolutely. I can, I can email the updated rendering to you. Okay. Apologies. If you can submit that to us via email or if you wish via mail, uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. So residents have also expressed concern that construction might result in damage to the residents in the historic district. Uh, if you could outline what steps uh, would be taken to reduce construction impacts on adjacent historic properties. Sure. So um, we abut one uh, property, or the construction project will abut one um, building. Uh, because that building is located within a historic district, um, we're subject to, to actually much more stringent um, shoring uh, and uh, construction monitoring uh, requirements. Um, I think I actually, the Department of Buildings has a memorandum um, that details the level of, I thought I had it in front of me, but I can submit it into the record that outlines the various requirements for um, buildings that are being constructed uh, adjacent to historic structures. Not only is it a, a higher standard for the actual uh, maintenance of the structural integrity of those properties, um, but it actually has monitoring requirements, um, very stringent requirements of monitoring any type of settlement with respect to, to those structures. If there's anything more than, I think it's a, a half inch of difference. Um, it may even be less, I can't remember off the top of my head. All construction has to be stopped immediately until um, they can identify the source of that, that settlement and, and rectify it. Um, so in terms of the impacts on the neighbor, um, both the Department of Buildings and the developer can be very vigilant to ensure that the structural integrity of that building is protected. Um, in addition, um, we've had an ongoing dialogue with uh, our neighbor, um, and we will be required to be doing underpinning, um, and we're going to be, in order to do so, we'll be required to enter into a, a license agreement um, with that property owner, um, and we're working to address um, any concerns that she has during the construction process. Um, in addition, um, not we just don't want to be cognizant of our immediate neighbors. Um, we're, we also want to minimize construction impacts on the rest of the residents on Bergen Street. Uh, to that effect, uh, we are, will be, uh, we're looking into ways that we can um, stage the construction site to, to minimize the impact on Bergen Street in terms of shutting down any lanes. Um, and uh, we'll also be providing notice to the residents uh, when construction will be commenced, as well as uh, contact information of the project manager, the owner's representative, the project manager, um, where residents, if any concerns arise, uh, can contact that individual on a 24-hour notice so that any concerns are, are promptly addressed. And just to clarify, with the construction I'm not expecting, given the height of the building, making sure there's no pile driving intended or anything unique that would create vibrations that might affect structures not adjacent. Um, I'm not sure about the actual, I don't know, Brian, are you? You want to get to the mic for that? Thank you. My name is Brian Ripple. I'm the project architect. Uh, at this point, the project's very preliminary in its design. There has been no geotechnical uh, investigations done on the site. I can tell you from past experience on comparable jobs, knowing the proximity, it's a 200-foot radius, uh, I believe, from the job site of monitoring that we have to do. And historically, to achieve the standards on vibration, uh, pile driving is not permissible. Uh, it would be a combination of either a mat slab construction or um, drilled piled or mini caissons. So um, similar to what would be required adjacent to subways and things like that, uh, just because of the, the impact uh, that you're talking about. We, again, we haven't done investigation on this site, but in Soho as well as on in the East Village, uh, comparable sites with, with similar concerns, and we we're able to achieve those vibration standards without, uh, by, by using means other than pile driving. 
And would you know more of the geotechnical before this application is considered by the City Council? Uh, probably, Talking about four months off? Yeah, probably not. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it would, it's retaining a whole team, and I don't know that ownership has done that yet, primarily because if the project isn't approved, that would be money that they, they wouldn't be investing in the, in the project. Um, it, would, it, would, it would require invasive borings, you know, they would have to do uh, at least uh, um, probably with the footprint four to five borings on the site, retain an engineer and do a whole geotechnical report, evaluation and, and, and design, yeah. So that hasn't been done yet. Okay, thank you. And residents have also expressed concerns, I believe it was a silk screening operation uh, that was behind the property and the possibility that there may have been chemicals leached into the rear yard, mm -hmm. even though they may or may not have been physically working sure. in that area, but at least uh, movement of the chemicals. And so this site will be for full excavation to do the garage. And we noted nothing was reflected in the environmental assessment in terms of that recent use, in terms of whether it had any consideration. Um, so. Uh, what assurances would be provided that the excavation itself for the garage would not propose a hazard for neighboring residents? Sure. So um, you're correct that uh, the environmental assessment statement um, relied on a phase one, which was a visual site inspection, um, which doesn't show any recognized environmental conditions. Um, however, uh, the, the environmental assessment statement also recommend uh, recommended the imposition of a hazmat um, e-designation, uh, which will require that um, sampling, a sampling protocol be uh, filed with the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation. Um, once that sample, sampling protocol is approved by OER, um, an actual phase two uh, site investigation uh, will be commissioned. Um, and once we have the results of those soil borings, they will be submitted to um, OER. Uh, OER will review them, determine whether any in environmental remediation is required. Um, if no environmental remediation is required, they'll se send what is called a, a notice to proceed to um, the Department of Buildings. It is only at that point that a building permit can be pulled um, to do any type of ground disturbance. Um, in the event that it's found that there is some type of contamination in the soil, um, we will have to submit a, a phase two work plan. Um, and there's uh, another, it's a health and safety plan that goes along with it. Um, so the phase two work plan is to demonstrate at, to OER what you're doing to remove those contaminants. Um, but the health and safety plan is to address the very concern that I believe um, has been raised by some of the neighbors, is to ensure that um, the, distur the ground disturbance, particular matter, our particulate matter does not get in the air, um, it could adversely impact to anybody in the neighborhood. Um, and some of, depending on the type of contaminants, how extensive they are, um, they can involve boxing in essentially a site uh, to prevent any type of particulate matter getting into the air um, and prevent that from being breathed, um, you know, breathed in by any of the, the surrounding neighbors as well as the, the construction team. Um, so that will be monitored um, by OER. None of that work can commence without OER's approval. Um, and, and so it will be, be adequately addressed in the construction process. Thank you. Yep. So in a larger respect in this community, there's been con concerns about displacement and the prevalence of uh, rent burden households. Uh, if you could identify what marketing strategies, such as designated one of the areas, uh, community affordable housing nonprofits as an affordable housing administering agent, um, mm -hmm. so what might be used in terms of tenant selection and to ensure the highest participation towards obtaining the affordable housing units uh, from residents of Community District Aid, and would such effort include a marketing strategy, for example, a financial literacy campaign to assist people to becoming lottery eligible? Sure. Um, so in terms of 
because we are approximately two years from entering uh, the, the, the actual marketing of the affordable units, we haven't selected an administering agent. Um, however, um, I am quite familiar with several of the administering agents um, that currently have passed sponsor review through HPD. Um, and several of them are based in Brooklyn. Um, and we have, my office has a good relationship working with them and they'll certainly be, um, we'll be requesting proposals from those type, those nonprofits. Um, and we are, can make a commitment to work with um, those nonprofits on a type of marketing campaign to ensure um, full participation um, uh, of you know, members of Community Board 8 so that we can um, get as close to, if not meet, the 50% uh, uh, preferred target um, for the affordable units within um, the Community Board. Um, in addition, we're happy to work with the, the Community Board's Housing Committee um, and, and to develop strategies to ensure that individuals who have the ability to apply um, have, are trained to put their application together to ensure that they make it into the lottery. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It is Borough President Adams' policy to promote the use of sustainable and renewable energy resources focused on advancing a sustainable future in Brooklyn. It's also his policy to promote practices to sustain uh, stormwater runoff. What consideration has been given a possibility in cooperation with the city's Department of Environmental Protection, Mayor's Office of Sustainability, NYSERDA, and NIPA towards incorporating passive house design, solar panels, blue, green, or white roof covering, mm -hmm. and permeable pavers or bioswells in the street bed? So we are currently um, actually um, investigating the possibility of having a green and solar combination roof. Um, in addition, the rear yard of our property um, will be landscaped with a combination of permeable pavers um, and green plantings. Um, that water will then, because it will sit on top of a garage, will be collected, um, um, as well as water on the, the roof, collected and retained in tanks to um, slowly infiltrate um, and be released into um, the, the sanitary, or I'm sorry, the stormwater sewer system um, to prevent flooding. So we'll be retaining that water on site and then slowly leaching it into um, the city stormwater management system. Um, but we're, we're also interested in pursuing as many environmentally sustainable um, construction uh, practices as possible. Um, given the, the small size of the project, some of that may be limited um, for economic reasons. Um, but um, Lauren, um, the property owner's daughter and uh, a representative on this project, has been researching various ways that we can advance um, the environmental soundness of uh, the proposed design. I'd like to have a serious conversation with your architect in terms of a passive house scheme because especially with a long-term retention of ownership in a property, the idea is you might pay a little bit more in your construction loan and therefore your permanent mortgage, but hopefully that's more than offset by the reduction of cost on paying for electricity. And then the type of jobs, rather than wherever you're purchasing your mechanical equipment, possibly overseas, that you're actually having more labor on the project, locally based labor doing the taping. So we have additional synergy from that as well. And finally, as mentioned earlier, Borough President Adams' policy is to maximize good quality jobs for Brooklynites. And if you could outline what steps would be taken to ensure inclusion and participation of minority and women-owned businesses, enterprises, and uh, local business enterprises in the construction of this site. Absolutely. Um, so as I had mentioned, uh, the developer is Brooklyn-based developer. Um, and uh, historically, over 50% of their contractors um, and uh, their suppliers are Brooklyn-based businesses. Um, we, that's been our track record on all of our developments and, and anticipate that that will continue in the future. Um, we'll also, as I had mentioned, the, this, 
developer is a minority um, and will be seeking MWBE certification um, on its own. Um, and we uh, will commit to um, reaching out to and soliciting MWBE um, bids for various contracts uh, on the project. Thank you. We have two speakers on this item. I have Kurt Langer followed by Carl Riddle. Thank you. My name is Kurt Langer. I'm the president of the 610 Dean Street Tenant Association. Um, 610 Dean Street is located kitty corner behind um, the proposed site. Um, and I'm also sort of speaking on behalf of the Dean Street Block Association, um, as well as a group of approximately 30 neighbors, most of whom are on Bergen, um, who have been discussing this development online together, sort of through, Bergen Street doesn't have an official association, but we've, we've all been kind of convening on this. Um, so we are thankful to the owner and developer for, um, for revising that plan with the dormers um, from the CB8 meeting. Um, there were sort of three takeaways that we really would love to lock down with you. Um, one of them was the reduced height and, and the, the greater setback on the dormers, which I see that you're already working on. Um, the second of those is having a 24-hour hotline where neighbors can address grievances or if we have concerns, get in touch. Um, and I would like to make sure that Dean Street neighbors are added to that um, because as you mentioned, that um, neighbors on Bergen Street would be given 24-hour notice if certain changes are happening with the construction. So I want you to please also consider the neighbors on Dean Street. Um, and then finally, um, helping us address some of the issues with your tenant on, on Dean Street in 594 or 592, which is the U USPS. So um, I'm in opposition to this um, zoning. Um, part, part of the reason is that we, there's, there's clearly, it's been expressed that there's, there's no feasible way to continue having a parking lot in this in this law, it has to be developed into something, and the only thing, the only feasible way economically to do it is um, through housing. Um, and I just, I just don't buy that premise. And we're actually facing a situation right now on Dean Street that's created by another development of yours, where there are sometimes as many as 10 illegally parked vehicles going up and down our block and oftentimes parked on the sidewalk because there's not enough parking. So I appreciate that there's an effort to work with the community neighbors to make sure that our addresses are, that our concerns are addressed in your planning, but it hasn't worked on Dean Street. And you, you must have known that leasing that space to the USPS, that there wasn't enough parking available, yet you own a lot adjacent to that space where, where um, you know, that would alleviate the parking situation there. So um, perhaps another th point that we would like to ask for is some way that through the development of that site that there be parking made available to some of the trucks that are parked on our sidewalk and, and creating a hazardous situation on our block on Dean. And then lastly, you've already addressed this, but with the concern for environmental hazards that you may discover on that lot. I know as someone who overlooks that lot, um, that when Yolano was the owner, they did store toxic chemicals there. And Yolano has been operating, in, had been operating in that site for I think almost 80 years. And even, even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when we moved to the block, it was the wild, wild west in that neighborhood. And so what, However, Yolano disposed of their chemicals. We have reason to be concerned that what's buried underneath that that pavement in the lot may be more than you're expecting. And so we would just like there to be a plan in place where you do some pre-testing that's subsurface, where if there's toxic chemicals that aren't just in the in the soil but actually still contained in in barrels or drums, but under that 
you're not going to be surprised by it and that there's some foresight put into that because as someone who lives a, right above that site and has children and we like to have our windows open and we like to breathe clean air, there's an environmental concern that may be more serious than what you're anticipating. So that's my, my final Thank concern. you. Yeah. So just hope that if you could convey when you converse with the part of the e-designation that your borings go down to the depth that you're going to excavate. Okay, our next speaker, Carl Riddle. Hi, my name is Carl Riddle. Um, I'm a secretary for 610 Dean Street Tenant Association. And I just wanted to thank the developer and uh, the representative and the committee today. Um, I think you've actually hit all points and Kurt has probably hit all of my points. Um, I just want to say, Thank you for your time to actually have a relationship with a neighbor. Uh, just to keep in mind, this is the community that has gone through the Barclays development and is impacted by the high density um, of that development. And it would be great to have a relationship. Uh, and I know the the 24-hour hotline has been said a few times now, but it's really important. Last week. Barclays, they were repaving, and I go to work in the morning at 5.30 a.m., and my car's gone. They just took my car and moved it a few blocks away. No notice to anyone. They moved the entire block. So um, I, I think that's all I'd like to say on that. And just, again, with the environmental, please, that's the thing about being in touch. I've been there since 2001. I have photographs of that lot because I would take photos out of my window. They stored those massive, you know, 55, they're not the 55 gallon drums, they're bigger than that. They're a chemical mixing company because they make acetates for film or the, the covering, the, the, uh, the layer that goes on acetate. So they've stored a lot of chemicals there and I just, you know, it's, it's for us that's a big thing. The, you know, when you put a giant auger in the ground 12 feet and see what's there, that's a big thing for us because we're, we're literally right behind this, this yard. Um, so thank you for your time. Thanks, Fred. And as part of the connection with the development team, perhaps you want to share what you have with them that help them plan where they do their test borings the, of the photographs that you have. Well, I, the thing is that the Ulano Corporation, which already has kind of a contentious relationship with the Bergen, street tenants because they idle trucks for hours and um, you know it's a thing it's a, it's a manufacturing area from another time and what's really important right now is that this is a precedent setting rezoning this is the first lot or group of lots that are going from M1 to residential on that block so uh, it, it used to be used for manufacturing, but real manufacturing. These are like uh, chemical mixing companies. So I don't have any photos of when they repaved, when they last repaved, um, but there is a drain right in the middle. I mean, I would, I would aim for the middle, I guess. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So are there any other speakers? So we don't have anybody signed up. Okay, so... The hearing on this item is now closed. Thank you for participating in this public hearing. Borough President Adams will review this application that we heard today and will soon submit his recommendations to the City Planning Commission. Borough President Adams would like to take this opportunity to remind you that the City Planning Commission will also hold public hearing on these items. Uh, the hearing is now adjourned. Borough President Adams would like to remind those viewing on the website that timely comments can be submitted to by email to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. So if you want to encourage people from Dean and from Bergen, they could certainly watch this hearing, this time to submit additional comments, additional testimony. We're happy to receive that. So that would be wonderful. Thank you.